A statement that I never thought that I would say in my lifetime, but the Taliban has officially taken over control of Afghanistan, and many of the Afghanistan civil citizens are attempting to flee the nation, even going as far to cling to airplanes. We break down everything that's going on. It starts right now. Welcome to the news and why it matters. Um, it's a weird fate that I am filling in for Sarah Gonzalez today, especially with what's going on in the world. Um, I wouldn't be able to do this day uh, without my two good friends, Chad Prather, Chad Prather Show, Blaze TV. Good to see you. Thanks for being here with me. You bet. And Yako Buyans, host of the Yako Buyans Show. Good Thank to you, be sir. here with you, two guys. Um, I am going to completely disregard the two gentlemen here for just a quick second because I have to tell you what is on my mind regarding Afghanistan. And before we get to today, I just want to go all the way back to September 11th, 2001. I was a United States Marine deployed uh, that night. I was actually sitting in a sports bar drinking some beers with my boys. And uh, we watched the towers come down, having no earthly idea what was happening. Um, that proceeded to follow with everyone, the shore patrol, rest of the Navy police there, taking us all uh, out of the bar, putting us on buses and going to the ships where we instantly sailed off to the coast of Pakistan. I remember that night very, very vividly. I remember the commander of the boat saying that, uh, gentlemen, December 7th, 1941 was our grandfather's and our father's day of infamy. And tonight, the world will come to know that September 11th, 2001 is our day of infamy. It is this generation's goal and it is this generation's duty to answer the call. And thousands upon thousands of soldiers did. I was one of the lucky ones. I was one of the ones that had a very clear mission statement. Our goal was to go in there and kick out the Taliban and shatter Al Qaeda. And I'm proud to say that we did that. Unfortunately, as I walked out of the country, flew out of the country, I noticed that the looks in the eyes of the sailors and uh, soldiers and Marines that were staying there did not have that clear cut objective. They did not know the goal of what they were um, being left there to do. I asked anybody on the ground, they didn't know what the goal was. But still, they marched on. They marched on training a Talib or a uh, Afghan National Army force that really wasn't down to do what they were being told to do. Pretty soon, the media reports kept going, and they were getting shot in the back. Our soldiers were getting shot in the back by some of the same people. Media reports began to diminish one by one. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of soldiers, Marines, sailors were dying due to this. But we all had the hope that it was not in vain, that eventually, what they were telling us, and apparently what the establishment was telling us, was that this was all for something. It was all going to mean something. And then this weekend happened, and pretty much all of that went away. We hoped that our dead brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters in arms, did not die for nothing. That they were not a mere statistic on a stat sheet that would be read off to the press, or read off to the American people, or some bureaucratic agency. But now that is what they were. That is what this administration has left them to be. This is probably the most egregious act of dishonor I have ever witnessed in my lifetime levied upon the soldiers, the men and women in uniform, and the rest of the country. Now, I want to, before I get to my two friends here, I want to get to the statement made by President Biden almost exactly one month ago. Listen to this. Is a Taliban takeover of Afghanistan now inevitable? No, it is not. Because you have the Afghan troops have 300,000 well-equipped, as well-equipped as any army in the world, and an Air Force against something like 75,000 Taliban. It is not inevitable. Mr. President, thank you very much. Your own intelligence community has assessed that the Afghan government will likely collapse. That is not true. Is it, can you please clarify what they have told you about whether that will happen or not? That is not true. They did not, they didn't, did not reach that conclusion. So what is the level of confidence that they have that it will not collapse? The Afghan government and leadership has to come together. They clearly have the capacity to sustain the government in place. And do you see any parallels between this withdrawal and what happened in Vietnam with some people feeling? With None whatsoever. Zero. What you had is you had entire brigades breaking through the gates of our embassy. 
six, if I'm not mistaken. The Taliban is not the South, the North Vietnamese Army. They're not, they're not remotely comparable in terms of capability. There's going to be no circumstance where you see people being lifted off the roof of a embassy in the, of the United States from Afghanistan. It is not at all comparable. So the question now is, where do they go from here? That, the jury is still out. But the likelihood there's going to be the Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is highly unlikely. Okay, so he's so sure, right? He's so sure just a month ago that the 300,000 capable Afghan army can hold their own. He was so sure. So what I want to know is who lied? Was it the intelligence community? Because they've come out over the past couple of days and said, no, we've been telling him he just disregarded. Was it the military? Was it General Milley? Is he the one that was feeding this information? Who? I want to see resignations on a mass scale. And if that does not happen, I want to see Congress get involved. If that doesn't happen, I want leakers to come out within the intelligence community to say, look, this is what happened. What happened? Chad, thoughts? There's got to be some accountability. You're right. There absolutely. needs to be resignations, as you said, on a mass scale. Uh, Joe Biden is absolutely inept. Uh, you can blame this on 20 years of whether you want to call it mismanagement or, or whatever, uh, having a misguided goal or not having a clear mission or a strategy in place ultimately to, to bring this out. There shouldn't be unending wars. I agree with that. But there has to be a strategy in place. Obviously, that strategy was not in place. This is a pompous inept administration right not only do you have ignorance on display but you have ignorance compared uh, or, or combined with arrogance that's there and when you start when you start arrogantly displaying your confidence and your confidence is based on ignorance it's very dangerous lives get lost uh, people are going to be sacrificed we're going to see that happen here we can talk about it more as we get into the show but at the end of the day the buck stops here right isn't that what happens you're the leader of the free world you're the guy who pulled the trigger you're the one who pushed the button you're the one who made the decision where does it stop? You're the guy who supposedly is the most popular president in the history of the United States. You're the one everybody wanted. You were the one that everybody believed could lead us and could, could be the commander in chief. And now you have bungled this thing to the measurements of which we won't know for a long time. Jacob, before I have you respond, I want to go to this. Uh, this is a quote from the White House. The White House released uh, this statement. But I'm going to skip over every single part of that statement right there and just go to the very last line. And it goes, when I uh, came into office, I inherited a deal cut my, my, by my predecessor, end quote. Um, so this is what you're going to find when you talk about this and you criticize the way it was handled. Um, is it fair, what do you think, uh, to criticize the Trump administration uh, and kind of basically pawn this off as, hey, look, we just did what we were, w w was laid out for us and what was given to us? Absolutely not, because this is from the playbook. This is what they do. What did Obama do in his first week when he stepped in? Hey, I inherited a whole bunch of crap, but don't worry. We're going to make we're going to make soup. He steps in. I inherited a deal. Of course not. He's the leader of the free world in this day, in this hour. He can make the decision based on the intelligence community feeding him. Now, somewhere this broke down or is it absolute disregard for human life? Disregard. This is this is what happens when you start believing that you're actually playing Monopoly and you get reckless with big life decisions, but it's actually impacting real lives that we saw in 2020, shutting the world down. It's the same people that made those decisions that are now making war decisions, Jason. This, it's the same. It's reckless decision making in the moment with no foresight, not looking a week down the road, 10 weeks, 10 years down the road, just going, you know what? This is great optics for our party. You know, we're going to do some things, make radical statements, don't care. And all of a sudden, a chopper's landing on the roof. And may I remind you, a friend of mine, an amazing guy, Mark Geist, they called for the chopper to land on the roof. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it never came. Hillary slept through it, wouldn't take the calls. Again, complete disregard. So we need to go back and historic look and see this is how they play. This is what they think of our soldiers. This is what they think of our country. They don't care. It's for their political gain in the moment with zero foresight and that's why and thank you for your service and thank you for breaking it down so eloquently that you had a mission a clear mission you guys accomplished that mission i immigrated to this country the same week you got on the boat to leave this country that's the week i immigrated mm. literally a week after 9 11 when you were going out to go defend this place that i now can call home i immigrated here right and it was one nation united and you accomplished that goal and then it's been there forever lingering process but he's the president of the united states it's his job to make the right decision 
right? Not reckless and, and you know, op- I don't know, Chad, if we can, I don't know, this may be a scandal upon scandals like Vietnam. I think that's an accurate comparison, mm-hmm. a very accurate comparison. Yeah? Hopefully, people will maybe this time around bless the soldiers when they see them and understand what our men and women in, 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 in uniform go through when they're just following command. Because right now, they've got, they've got bad, bad command at the top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I was particularly, I guess, a little pissed off when they tried to pawn it off on the Trump administration, because what is the first thing that um, Biden did? His very first day when he took the oath, he went straight into the Oval Office and he started saying executive. Remember, there's like 12, 15, yeah. 7, how can I remember? I lost count of how many executive uh, orders are there. It was a spectacle. All it was doing was saying, look, I'm undoing everything the president did. Now, you're telling me that he did, was going to undo every single thing policy wise that President Trump did, except for the Afghanistan plan? Mm-hmm. That was the one thing that he was like, okay, I'm just gonna keep that in place. I'm not, we're not gonna touch that. We're just gonna let it go as is, but everything else we're gonna change. Bull crap. Yeah. The, other, um, the other excuse they're having is now they're, they're, the, the entire uh, administration is trying to weaponize and say, oh, it's, it was just the Afghan army. In fact, we have um, Secretary Blinken uh, trying to say that it was the Afghanistan's uh, military's fault purely. Watch this. Does President Biden not bear the blame for this disastrous exit? from Afghanistan? Uh, Jake, we've seen two things. First, uh, we've known all along, uh, we've said all along, including the president, that the Taliban was at its greatest position of strength uh, at any time since 2001, when it was last in charge of the country. That is the Taliban uh, that we inherited. Uh, And so we saw that they were very much capable of going on the offensive uh, and uh, beginning to take uh, back the country. But at the same time, we had invested over four administrations billions of dollars, uh, along with the international community, in the Afghan security and and defense forces, uh, building a modern military uh, with the most sophisticated equipment, 300,000 forces strong, with an air force that the Taliban didn't have. Uh, And the fact of the matter is, uh, we've seen that that force has been unable to defend the country, and that has happened more quickly than we anticipated. That's a statement from an official that has no idea what the hell he's talking about, and he doesn't even know how to respond. He no. really doesn't, because he knows in his mind that literally a month ago they were saying the exact opposite. opposite. The exact opposite. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, he said you can't buy willpower uh, when he was talking to Congress on Sunday. Um, really? Because that was your plan for 20 years. That mm-hmm. was your plan for 20 years, buying willpower. This is the exact same outcome now that they had in Iraq. They spent you know, billions of dollars training and supplying uh, an Iraqi army that eventually left as soon as also another foreign policy blunder. You mentioned Benghazi earlier. Yeah. But um, when, they put, when Obama pulled out troops out of, uh, out of Iraq too soon, mm-hmm. ISIS showed up. Now what's going to happen? I mean, I, you know, it, the sky is the limit now with this administration. Jason, I'll just tell you this. I mean, I've been on so many teams in my life. You served here, I served there. You cannot put fight in a dog. He's born with it or he doesn't have it. To think that the Afghan army will actually hold fort, why didn't they? Why didn't they in the 50s and the 60s and the 80s? Why didn't they? they? They were not. Why did they shoot our troops in the back, as you were saying? They were not going to. There's no way. It, it's been a no plan. Now, they, this guy literally, and I said it on this show, watch there'll be a war in the Middle East this year. This is Israel's greatest threat, America pulling out like this. He just handed that nation to the Taliban. That's what he did. And, and not just that, if they're so dangerous, firstly, you say they're not dangerous, 75,000, they got no shot. Well, if they're so dangerous as you say, why did you hand them our, our gear, our choppers, our ammunition, our technology? Why did you leave it there? If, if, you, if, if in fact, this idiot is accurate and you knew that they were dangerous, you're just going to leave it to them. Say, thank you, Jason, for your service, buddy. It was a nice exercise. He, Yaku brought up, Chad, the, uh, the Maghazi thing. I want to hit that again because, in, in Syri- like I said, in Iraq, they screwed up the exact same thing. In fact, every single thing I can think of, these are the same, these are the Obama people. The exact same ones, he just took same. them right back. It's basically yeah. Obama 2.0. They've screwed up every single foreign policy to thing that I can even think of. What makes us think, America, that they can handle domestic policy if they can't even <laughs> handle any of these? Well, our, our foreign policy is certainly um, a nightmare in regards, and it has been for a long time, especially when liberals are in charge, when Democrats are in charge. We saw when LBJ pulled out of Vietnam. Of course, we left our allies behind. Mm. Uh, we saw what happened there. Now we're seeing what's happening in Afghanistan. You pull out, and, and you know, one of the things you can place the blame squarely on the, uh, the, the Biden administration, almost said Obama, but you're right, it is just Obama 2.0. 
we had interpreters there. We had we had Afghan patriots. We had allies who were there. Some of which had the top, the highest security clearance that a non-American could have, serving alongside our men and women. Uh, and they were a great fighting force. These were people who literally made themselves a target by allying themselves with the forces of, of the United States. And uh, we 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 left. There were about eighty thousand of them. We left about thir- we gave about thirty thousand visas to get them out of the country, which left fifty thousand of them vulnerable. Uh, I'm receiving uh, information, intel, if you will, from people who are there, people who are there, because let's face it, there are a lot of special forces operators right now who are going into that country. They're finding a means and they're finding a way. They're going in to rescue their interpreters and rescue these families, get them out and get them to other countries uh, to get them to safety, because they're saying they're sending pictures saying here. Here's a picture of your house. We know your wife and daughters are here. We plan to rape them. We plan to murder you. This is what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, we left these people at, at the height of vulnerability. They're now going door to door. The Taliban is knocking on doors saying, were you allied with American forces? Uh, the consequences, of course, as we know, are going to be what they are. These people, this is tribalism. This is tribalism to the nth degree. You know, I'm not that smart, but my God, I'm not that ignorant either to sit there and think that after all these years of dealing with Middle Eastern policy, they were not any smarter to understand that these guys, whenever we turned it back over to this government, they were going to cave. They were going to cave. They, because this has been happening for tens of uh, thousands of years. I mean, it's insane that this, and we still aren't any smarter to realize that, that this is tribalism, and yeah. we have no concept of it. Uh, the Benghazi thing, again, we leave our people behind. The whole thing, we leave our people behind, and that's what's happening. And you know what? Guess what, America? When it comes to your domestic policy, they're going to leave you behind as well. We've already started to see it. You're, you've been called non-essential, all these other things. They're leaving people behind. Uh, yeah. I, I got it. Well, we have to wrap this up, but with everything you described, you know, an on-fire domestic, uh, you know, situation, on, on-fire foreign policy situation. It's almost like the 1970s have come back. It's mm-hmm. just that we don't have Errol Smith and we don't have cool cars. Uh, that's <laughs> the only difference. More when we come back. And the right Batman. <laughs> yeah. oh. <laughs> right Batman. Welcome back to the news and why it matters. So we're actually taping this uh, before the airtime. So as we're taping this now, Biden is actually addressing the nation, which before he said he wasn't going to do it for two to three days. Um, he is, obviously, you know, he's on vacation, guys. We can't, you know, what, yeah. he, that's all. There's a lot of pudding to eat and there's a lot of naps to be taken, you know, in between then. Um, and uh, Press, Secretary, Press Secretary Saki is also on vacation. Um, but anyway, somehow he found his way to mosey on up to the mic and make a statement today. But from what I am seeing so far is he's sticking to one of the talking points that we just said, which is this is pretty much inherited. It's Trump's fault. He mentioned May 1st, which if you talk about this on Twitter to anyone, that's what they'll throw out. They'll throw out the quote from Trump saying we need to get out by May 1st. I would like to counter that by saying we don't know what Trump's plan was. Exactly. We know that he did want to take the, uh, the troops out. We knew he, we, he wanted to do it by May 1st. And that's it. We don't know anything else. We don't know. Look, there's two things you can argue here. You can argue for, let's get the troops out. We don't want forever wars. I'm a firm believer in that. Yes, exactly. But you can also argue that this was bungled at a historic level. The way they did it, the way they decided to do it was wrong. Like you can't defend it at all. So this is entirely on President Biden, entirely Mm -hmm. on him. There's just no way for him to go around it. I'm, I, I'm just flabbergasted by some of the scenes we're seeing that are coming out of um, a Kabul. The U.S. has suspended flights at Kabul airport after swarms are, of people are hitting the runways. If you're um, listening to this in the podcast, there are just thousands of people hitting the uh, runway there in, uh, in Kabul at Karzai airport, trying to get to aircraft. They're clinging to the landing gear of some of these uh, uh, um, aircraft as they're trying to get out. What does this say to, for one, and I guess I'll direct this to you, Chad. First off, what are they running from? And what does that say about US, you know, United States liberties, U- United States culture, everything that we hold dear, they're trying to run towards while our government here is trying to say it's oppressive and evil. Yeah, remember, remember pre-COVID when everybody was in the streets of Hong Kong and they were waving the yeah. American flag? Yeah. And you remember recent, in recent weeks they were in uh, Cuba and they're ra- waving the American flags. We're so oppressive, us Americans. Yeah. You know, one uh, of the only militaries that exists uh, in history that liberates people rather than oppresses them. And, and let me just go on record as saying to, to the men and women who have put on a uniform with the willingness to serve, sacrifice, and potentially give their lives for our liberty, our veterans, our active duty military, God bless that 1% of our population who had the balls to do what, what, what needed to be done. Uh, but to get sold out at the top level like this, and, 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 you, and, and, and I know, I've talked with a lot of folks that have, 
seven, eight deployments uh, to Afghanistan, mm-hmm. and, and they're they're laying awake. These are fighting men. These are warriors, and they're, they're texting me saying, "Man, I'm up all night long worrying about these families that I know that I worked with." Yeah. And these are those families running down the runway, tying themselves. Look at that That's to uh, the landing gear of these C-130s. You know, in, in the Biden administration, we're playing games, man. We're playing games. Like, we're, what are we going to do now? We're going to send in a, a, a wow. couple of uh, plane loads of social workers. I mean, you know, we got we got little TikTok dancing, uh, manicured uh, ha- interns there at the White House. Th- these are the games we're playing, right? We're trying to look cool. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're trying to be little celebrity politicians over here. And these folks are literally trying to run to the last bastion of freedom they know exists on the planet. Yeah. I, so, I, you know, I think you're the perfect guest to answer this question right now, because as you see all these people that are trying to get out of the country, there still is a significant security threat to, to this. Um, some people have been vetted, they, they need to get over here because they helped us. But now I fear that the Biden administration is gonna use this as another virtual signal to the world, and they're gonna start increasing uh, refugees coming into the country, especially by places like Af- uh, of, uh, Af- Afghanistan. Uh, Should I be worried about this? Uh, very, very, very worried. This is creating a problem and then benefiting from the problem. And this is what they do. Create this function and in the, in, in the order of chaos, find that one little window to benefit the party, to siphon off money, to enrich, to, to further corrupt the American people. And we should be really, really worried. Remember, not, not to reminisce and make people think, but those guys who flew those planes into American buildings, came from elsewhere with bad intention, was trained on domestic soil, got their pilot licenses here. I'm telling you, this is tough for me to say as an immigrant because I, you cut me now, I bleed wet, red, white, and blue. I love this country. I left a country of oppression. You know, I, I, left, I lived in Canada under socialism for crying out loud. They're running to those planes because America's free. Free, we're free, this is freedom. That's oppression, but we're gonna import by design the next class of local terrorists in this country that's kind of come and infiltrate and we know how they work. They set up shop, they own the laundromats, they come in, they, they build their communities, they take 10, 15 years, and then all of a sudden you see they, them strike. And they're gonna come in by the order of the President of the United States. This is the, arguably one of the biggest disgraces of our history. This will be a mark, you hear me that Benghazi was bad. Benghazi was really, really, really bad. Mm-hmm. And we had real soldiers on that roof, right? This, I don't know how you measure this because you're right, you said off the air. They're gonna bring refugees in if they're not already coming in through the Mexican border. If the Taliban wasn't already coming in, because we know 100 nations have already flown, you know, flooded the border. But him proactively saying bring refugees in and settle them here, who's gonna vet them, Jason? They can't even vet the next 18 year old that's yeah. walking across, you know, the Texas border today, they don't even know who that guy is and where he comes from. We're, I mean, I think as most conservatives, they're not anti-immigrant. They're just or, or immigration. They're for immigration done correctly. Yes. And never let a crisis go to waste is exactly what these people believe in. And so watch them make the transition from, okay, yeah, we screwed that up, but now we have to focus heavily on the refugee crisis, not only from places like Where's this, but all over the world. Where's your bleeding heart? Come on. bleeding heart? We gotta take care of people. I take what, care of the American people. The New York Times just did an article, I think, was yesterday it was over the weekend where they were sounding very cozy about the Taliban they were saying they were highlighting this mayor in, in some town in Afghanistan saying how he was now Taliban and how he was looking to provide goods and services for the people and it, it was just like almost as if they were like saying maybe the Taliban's not gonna be so bad um, and it kind of cracks me up because uh, CNN was on the on the streets and they have this like one very very she's actually a very very brave chick I've seen her doing a lot of uh, stuff in, in, in war zones but um, she had something interesting to say. You just listen to your for yourself. Watch. They're just chanting death to America, but they seem friendly at the same time. It's utterly bizarre. Utterly bizarre. Yeah. Death to America, but they seem <laughs> relatively so, peaceful. So mostly peaceful <laughs> pr- protest at this point in time. Uh, what's interesting, so that was taken on the 16th, that little clip. On the 15th, she wasn't wearing a hijab. But just in one day, yep. one day, we yeah, there it that is. Picture, yeah. There it is. Clarissa Ward with CNN. Uh, she's she, there. She is one day apart. Uh, there's the future of women's rights in Afghanistan, folks. Oh, uh, b- believe me, Sharia law is coming. It is coming to Afghanistan. And I mean, some of these like no cr- doubt, no doubt, no, no I, doubt. Faster than you can say fast, it's going to come. And where will people like Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar? 
where will they be when you start seeing you know, members of the LGBTQ community thrown off rooftops. I'd like to get a statement from them right now. Yep. Right now. Absolutely. How are you well, going to Well, they're going to blame Trump for a while. That's what they're going to do. Okay, but see, right. here's the thing. Here's the thing. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, Yakin. But no, I, and I, if I don't say it, I'll forget it. But, you know, the guy, who was it, Blinken, who comes on and says, oh, they were ready. They were prepared, right? 300,000 strong. We left them with equipment and all that stuff. But then Biden's statement from the White House is, well, we inherited this mess. Yeah. Well, which was it? Were they strong? Were they empowered? You were can't they have it both ways. Or were, was it a mess? Which one was yeah, it? exactly. Which statement are you going to go with? Because yep. you're saying both. Mm -hmm. But they know yeah. they can, Chad, because they know the general American today, and this is, I'm not trying to be derogatory, but it just flies over their head because it's white noise. It's all white noise. That's racist. <laughs> white noise. <laughs> But, but you know Come what? On. But to your point, to your point, and the, I and, like and, white noise. You got a problem with that? <laughs> Meet me in the parking Listen, lot. This, why, why are you being so mean to these brown people, man? Why won't you just let 50,000 of them be housed at Fort Bliss? I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. But this is the kind of rhetoric, you're right, they are going to spin it. And then it's going to be about us oppressive Americans mm -hmm. once again. We're not, we, we are liberators. We are liberators. Our men and women in, in uniform are liberators by and large. And, and that is what we do across the board historically. We pull these countries out. But this is a debacle, man. And, and we, we haven't seen, and you're right, unfortunately, our southern border is wide open. They know the easiest way to get across. They're emptying the prisons. They're emptying the prisons in Afghanistan. They're releasing terrorists into the wild, if yep. you will. Yep. And, and, and they're already showing up and on how the southern are we border gonna, from these nations. And how are we going to know? Did that guy come from prison? You know, was he incarcerated right. as a terrorist? And now he's going to come in under asylum. He's going to scream asylum, asylum. And this administration is going to say, welcome. Yeah. Welcome. And then they're going to make it a news article and say, look how good we are. This is what they are today. This is where they have cross-dressing, whatever you want to call that element that's walking around the White House with these white nails and you know, yeah. playing sake and hey, Joe. Right? This is what they are. They're a TikTok administration. Yeah. That's what they've been reduced to. It's all instantaneous hit and just give me a news hit. Talk good about me. Talk ba bad about me. Just spell my name right. And that's basically mm -hmm. who Joe is. It's, it's absolute incompetence on a grandiose scale. And his comments, you know, a month ago, talking about how they were ready and how this I mean that is the perfect example of how dangerous these people are abroad how dangerous are they domestically we come there next I'm just reading through more updates on uh, uh, the president's speech I mean he is sticking to his guns on blame I know I said I would go pivot to domestic but still as we said earlier, do not let him put this on President Trump. No. Do not let him do it. If people are on social media saying, no, this is President Trump's fault, and they quote that May 1st deadline, just always point out the fact that we don't know what President Trump's plan was. And why should we expect that the Biden administration just went along with that plan? Of course they did. They scrapped it. This was all for political purposes, bar none. Don't let him shift the blame. Anyway, I'm done. Um, so... I remember seeing when the CDC uh, did their little thing and basically kind of started governing for the president when they eat, you know, put the moratorium on um, on the um, more, uh, evictions. Mm -hmm. And that kicked off a bunch of warning bells to me because I was like, this is exactly what progressives since the turn of the century wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Place the power out of the hands of the people in Congress and put it in the hands of the bureaucracy that, by the way, are already in their back pockets. So we're seeing the fruition of that happening right now. And I posed the question then, I was like, which alphabet soup agency is next? Well, we just got this from the Department of Homeland Security. They have just warned, put out a fresh new bulletin uh, that warns that COVID-19 restrictions could spark violent attacks. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security in a new terrorism warning moment said violent extremists could view the reimposition of COVID-19 related restrictions following the spread of coronavirus variants as a rationale to conduct attacks. So check this out. So if you have any dissent whatsoever, Right. If you're like if you're somebody like me and probably like you guys that would say the time I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the time for mass civil unrest is here. Peaceful. Right. But when they tell you to put something on, don't comply. When they put a tell you to what to dress, you know, how to dress and what to put on your face, don't comply. Um, when they try to tell a business owner that you can only have 25 percent of your uh, your guests inside your establishment, don't comply. It's going to take all of us. But now we're going to be considered terrorists. What it sounds like. If we do that, 
Chad. Yeah, so they came out with a statement that said if you observe certain religious holidays or if you want to observe a Remembrance Day for 9-11, uh, if you want to push back against mandates such as mask mandates or vaccinations or anything, these are all potential signs of being terror suspects. Uh, listen, you know, you, you want to you talk about an insurrection being on January 6th, right? But then you look at these Taliban forces that are in the presidential palace sitting around that desk with AK-47 slung across their arm. That's what an insurrection looks like. Mm -hmm. It's not some little old lady carrying a podium out or, you know, some, that, this, these guys right here who are not social distancing, who are not wearing masks, which really pisses me off, uh, <laughs> these guys. They, they, there's no... There's no uh, uh, representation of old other genders. Yeah, no diversity I, at there's all. There's no diversity at yep. all. Yep. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> what is wrong with these people, these barbarians? Uh, they, they're, they're, not, they're not social distancing at all. This is the kind of thing. But see, these are the kind of things we worry about. Right. right? Because, because, listen, we live such coddled lives as Americans that in times of peace and in times of our, of our spiritual obesity, we come up with stupid oppressions like, and, and things to combat them, like Antifa and BLM and Me Too movements. We come up with Occupy Wall Street. We don't have real problems in America. We, we're dealing with where can we get the next round of fast food and 99 cent heart attacks in a brown paper sack. This is real, folks. This is the rest of the world. Yeah. And, and this is the kind of thing right here that is going to take us over because whether you like their idea, ideologies or not, these dudes are tough yeah. and we're not. Listen, there's a reason why I said, I said when they shipped you boys off into the desert, I'm from Africa, and I said, I don't know. I don't know if the American soldier has ever been prepared to fight that kind of a war. It's a different kind of a war. It's dirty. They'll fire in a hospital. They'll strap a bomb to a kid. It, it, and it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's in tunnels. It's not distance, night, you, know, fro, you know, see the enemy where they're at. It's a whole different, this is Africa. This is tri, it's tribal. Mm -hmm. It's tribal. And may I remind people, this leads to beheadings. I'll show you videos on my phone, arms chopped off in Central Africa by some of these boys who are annexing Central Africa, right? Driving people out. This is real. And yes, as bad as COVID is, and as bad as it is to put a diaper on your face, which I will not do, and I know I won't take the jab. And yes, it's time to say no to all of the above. I stand with you. You're not putting words in my mouth. I say it's time to go to the street and within the law, yeah. take this country back within the law, right? right? Right. But this is a blunder of all blunders by this administration because now you just up the ante to go from putting a diaper on your face to saying, hey, potentially bring those people here domestically. And in their mind, you're the infidel. You're, you're, you might have well been Satan himself. They're coming for you. And these guys don't play. They're yeah. seasoned. They're trained. You know, they're trained from 10, 8, 9, 10, 11. They're shooting AK-47s with, with complete disregard for human life. And, and, and so this is what we're seeing. And it's basically just... Handed to them by Sippy Cup Joe. We're going to go it's, from masks to leather necks. And you as a Marine know exactly <laughs> what I mean by that because they bring in their scimitars and they start chopping heads. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. This truly is the administration and the party really of chaos. I mean, where everything they're doing now has brought chaos, whether it's police, um, whether it's foreign policy out in Afghanistan or... And this was one of those executive orders that Joe Biden signed off on his inaugural day, um, the border. Um, a federal judge in Texas has ordered the Biden administration to revive a Trump era border policy that required migrants to stay in Mexico until their U.S. immigration court date. So this was one of those obvious ones, right? Like yeah. these, this is something that was working. It was like, why would you even mess with this? But it, again, it was because of the political optics. That's what it was all about. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm curious about a future governor, what he would do about the border situation right now. OK, so the states, does, we have a federal government because the state said, hey, we need an overarching government that will protect us from invasion. When the federal government does not protect us from invasion, it is up to the states to enable their sovereignty and their rights to protect their own borders. We have the right to do that. Take the state of Texas, for instance. We have National Guard we can deploy. We have DPS. We have all the resources that the military has. We can, we can protect our own borders. The Tenth Amendment gives us that right. The Texas, the Texas uh, uh, Constitution gives us that right. We have the ability to go in there and protect ourselves. Right now, the federal government's left us hapless. I mean, we're, we're absolutely uh, being overrun here. This, this is an invasion of epic proportions that's going on right here at home and it's not just happening in our border counties or our border states it's happening all over the country because we're busing them into the interior and flying them into the interior of the united states where they'll never be found again so so with a situation like this 
the federal government's going to get this. They, they want to come back to, uh, you know, stay-at-home policy, all this. It's going to get tied up in appeals. It's going to be tied up in the courts, and it's not going to change a single damn thing. At some point in time, the state's got to step up, be sovereign, take back their rights, and say, the buck stops here. You're not going to do it. We're not going to let this get tied up in the courts. We're stopping it right here. want to build a wall? Let's build a human wall. Yeah. Let's enable Let's enable the folks yep. who can enforce the laws that are on the books and let's stop it right here. That policy, keep them in Mexico until due process is, has gone through. Well, they can't right now because the last 50 miles in Mexico is run by the cartels, right? right? It's run by the cartels. They'll die staying in Mexico because Joe opened it up. But you make a good point. Think about this. If your homeowners association doesn't do their job, but your homeowners association says, hey, if a burglar comes in your house, you can't fire. Because we, the Homeowners Association, is supposed to keep you safe, but we decided that that person has a right to go swim in your pool. Does that logic make sense? That's the logic of asking the federal government to defend Texas. I say kick the federal government out of Texas mm -hmm. completely. We don't need you. We don't want you. We're one of, you know, one of the top 20 you know, economies in the world by ourselves. If we were a nation, take the state back, build the human wall, show force, show justice, show yeah. law and order, and push back. Isn't that, isn't that who we are, as a matter of fact, right? Yeah. And all Texans will support that, but waiting on the government to solve a single problem is a nightmare uh, today. I, I'm, Jason, I'm at the place where I'm telling you, I don't know that there's a minute that this administration thinks about the American people. Yeah. They think only about their next media hit, their gain, their how gain. They, uh, the fat cats that can siphon off money from their trillions of dollars of new stimulus package or whatever they're doing. And you know the best business model in the world is war. Yeah. Oh, how, yeah. How they can build upon and expand their power based off of your plight. That's how I feel pretty much all governments in general. But I think the goal here uh, for us and the solution, federalize, federalize, federalize. Go back to your states. You need to all the way down to you know, your school board, yep. your sheriff. Your sheriff is sheriff. very, very County important. County commissioner. County commissioner, um, your mayor, all these. Those should be the most important elections you should be thinking about. Sure. Not elevating a president to no. superstar status or a, or a congressman or senator. That's, That's right. it. And then to your governor, uh, of course. Of Back course. in a minute. <laughs> So we've talked a little bit about nation building, talked about it in Iraq, talked about it in Afghanistan. Um, the United States pretty much taints everything they do when they get into the business of nation building. Um, and <sighs> Haiti is in the news now because they just had a massive earthquake. 1,300 people have now been confirmed uh, killed. Um, but that, they're saying that's, that could even rise to tens of thousands. And it's, it's hor horrifically tragic because, I mean, I'm just looking back, th again, the progressive area around 1915, Woodrow Wilson sent troops into Haiti, um, occupied Haiti, and then didn't leave. Stayed there for 20 years, see if this sounds familiar. Um, they, got, they went in because of massive civil unrest and they tried to assassinate, the, or they did assassinate their president. And the same thing just happened. Mm -hmm. And now it's natural disaster after natural disaster after natural disaster. It's, it's horrific. Um, Yako, I know that you've actually got um, actual people on the ground there dealing with things. What's the situation like? Yeah, right now, something that's very interesting is gangs have taken over and gangs are stopping convoy, medical convoy from coming in, holding ransom, you know, kidnapping those who are hurt that have been rescued for ransom. We've got, we've got, funny enough, a lot of Marines on the ground there. And so there's been a request to their Minister of Justice to ask the U.S. Ambassador and ask Samantha Powell, who is basically put in charge of the situation, to deputize U.S. Marines, is what they're asking their administration to do, to deputize U.S. Marines to at least just hold fort so that medical convoy can get, that medical help that's coming in mostly from the U.S. can actually get to people because it's being blocked right wow. now. Gangs are blocking help to come to those who need it most you know, for, for financial gain. But I have to reminisce on this, you know, because I'm thinking Hillary Clinton, Haiti earthquake, you know, the Red Cross, $4 billion raised, zero done. Oh, same team. Yeah. The Clintons, the Obamas, the Bidens, here we go again. So look, wherever they walk, go to Portland today. They destroy, wherever they, whatever they touch, Chad, they deplete, they're like Zorgons that does planet hopping and just suck life out of an area and bring the criminals in and let them run amok. You know, I mean, it's, it's insane. It's, it's, uh, no matter where you go, big government uh, is going to be a, a progressive government. 
And uh, I mean, uh, is going to be a uh, corrupt government. I went down with a Catholic charity and um, they didn't even like to take in their goods into Haiti through the normal port. They would go to like a side port because the government officials would take the stuff that was coming in, keep it for themselves and sell it off to make a buck. Um, I, I don't know. It's just like it, it's just a perfect example of you can't trust any government. You know, like yeah. any, any large government is going to be corrupt. We live in a corrupt world. Mm. Uh, we have been defined throughout history with man's inhumanity to man. That's not going to go away, folks. The heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. We know that. We've been told that from the Proverbs of old, from the prophets of old. Uh, it, it's, it's proven over and over again. People are corrupt. Uh, the love of money, not money, the love of money is the yep. root of all evil. Uh, and and when, you, when you can capitalize on crisis and get away with it, it's going to continue happening over and over again. We've seen it in Afghanistan. We've seen it in Haiti. We've seen it in Puerto Rico when the, when the storms hit. We, we've seen it all over. We see it in America now. I used to think that America at least sent out a beacon of hope, and now I'm starting to even doubt that. Yeah. There's something I know, and again, that, that's coming from, you know, a, a left-leaning, uh, you know, country right now. That, um, that says that we're evil people, that says that we're bad people, um, and says that, you know, we come from, you know, basically rights, white supremacists. And um, we're the most charitable country on earth. Mm -hmm. I've been, like I said, I've been to Haiti, and there's people that dedicate their lives to going down there to educating kids. They set up orphanages. They send tons and tons. Yako, you, you've basically, you're one of these people. 29 trips to that island. I've had 29 trips to that island. And of course, we go in to fight sex trafficking and, and rescue children. But you can't find an, a nation on earth, even those who are not friendly to us, where you will not find Americans teaching people to read, doing missions, drilling water wells in Uganda, educating kids in the middle of Bangladesh, in, in places where it's illegal to be a Christian, your head can be chopped off, helping the underground church. America is, is love. This is the greatest nation, and this administration has, in a very short window, with all their cronies, you know, the criminal news network, CNN, come and convince some Americans that somehow we're evil. Jason, Americans don't know evil. You're right. They don't really know evil, what it's really like for a kid to be raised in Uganda or, you know, you know the DRC under Kabila. With it's, it's the military that's raping the women. It's the military in Haiti that's taking all the food. You know, it's the South African police force, you know, that's burning, burning the streets down at times. You know, they don't know what that looks like. Here we have police that serve and protect, and we want to defund the police. We want to defund the good guys and then sit and complain. Oh, I can't believe how bad it is. Yeah, because you broke it. It's a beautiful nation that helps literally everybody. I mean, may, may we remember, not too long ago, a president of the United States stepped into a country which no president had stepped into modern day. Donald Trump stepped in and shook Kim Jong-un's hand and, and somehow made progress. Joe, in seven months, <laughs> has done more destruction than even Obama could do in eight years. This guy is on a, on, a re, on, a, on a rip at the moment, or those that control him. Yeah. And that's what I want to get down to. Who are the real players? It's not Joe Biden. Come on, this guy couldn't find the White House in the lawn of the White House. He got lost. Okay. Find the door. <laughs> okay. <laughs> couldn't stay on the sidewalk. I, I mean, who's really? We, these are the questions, and people go, you can't mention these names. No, I want to go after the Gateses, and the Clintons, and the Soroses, and the Obamas. Well said. Back in a second. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Please, if you can, subscribe um, and uh, give us a five-star review because anything less would uh, be uncivilized. Um, I'm going to throw Sarah Gonzalez a little um, favor here and because I know you'll do it if I tell you. Um, but if you do, then you also get your review read on, on the air like this one. The only news worth watching. I quit watching corporate news years ago. The blaze is it. And the news of my own matters is the one I never miss. We thank you, Kyo uh, Fixer. <laughs> We're right there with you. Thanks for watching, guys. Catch you next time.